Okay, this is Masters of Podcasting. I'm Conley. I'm Melissa. And today we're going to be talking about Episode 6, Brave New World. I guess one of the first things that I wanted to talk about was the, the self-confidence in this episode and the different ways that we see it expressed in the different characters. Particularly, I'm thinking of Jenny. Last episode, but obviously, we saw Bill at his absolute worst. And this episode, we see Jenny not quite at her absolute best, but feeling much more powerful and having much more agency than she has really to this point in time. Did you think this was a kind of win the cats away situation or was this Jenny maybe trying to to grab as much power as she could and really find her own place in this study uh, while Bill was out of the picture? I really saw it as an evolution of Ginny's intentions and ambitions throughout the episode. I think at the end of last episode, she probably felt, I don't know, not relieved that Bill was suffering, but relieved that there had finally been this emotional breakthrough that she had been present for and that she'd kind of guided him through or helped him with. And at the start of this episode, she seems more comfortable in branching out and like you said, starting to reach for a little bit more, not power over Bill, but sort of to pull herself up so that they're more on the same level as far as the study goes. Like she's still his secretary there at the start, but she's attending lectures with his faculty ID in hand. And when he uh, leaves to go on vacation, she starts to branch out even more. She sees it as an opportunity to start looking into Freudian theory, to start experimenting with it, and to ultimately prove it wrong. Um, well, and I, I love the scene when uh, they're talking on the phone and he's in Miami and he says, go into my office. And she says, oh, I'm already here. And there's that pause and he says, are you sitting in my desk? I just, I love that little moment because it's so, I think, perfectly illustrates the, the turn that's happening in their relationship, you know, Jenny is on the rise and she's feeling more comfortable. And, you know, so now Bill is trying to have to not deal with that, but understand that new role. Na- kind of navigate the fact that, I mean, he knows damn well that she's sitting in his chair. He, he, oh, yeah. he knew right off the bat and he probably knows that she lied, but still they're they're getting more comfortable. And that scene actually even illustrates that they're, Um, becoming closer, at least uh, mentally, professionally, because they finish each other's sentences and they're very much on the same wavelength, at least until Jenny kind of scuttles the conversation. But we'll get to that in a bit. Um, What I wanted to talk about first was the whole idea of Jenny and the dual orgasm, Freud's theory about immaturity versus maturity in the female orgasm. And the women are, like, even though she's, Bill's not around to keep her in check as she tries to become more and more of a researcher on his level. The women around her uh, work to keep her back, in a sense. And this happens a couple of different times. First, she tries to impress DePaul, Dr. DePaul, by offering her help. But Dr. DePaul shoots her down really firmly because she still sees her as just a secretary. But Ginny is undeterred, and she feels free to run experiments with Jane. And Jane ultimately hesitates because Dr. Masters isn't there. But then she goes along with it. And I think this can be read as a bit of meta-contextuality. It's two attempts at achieving something bigger, but the traditional method that Ginny tries of offering up help as a secretary doesn't work as well as the rebellious or the individualistic method, which is what we know will bring greater success to Masters and Johnson. So I think I think the writers were kind of tying her foray into uh, researching Freud's two types of orgasms to the two ways that Jenny tries to go out and affect change while Bill is away. Well, I, I especially like the parallel that they drew there in the sense that we we have commentary in the show, well, Freud's theories have limitations. You know, Bill says, I stopped reading him after information on the Oedipus complex. And so here you see Jenny really pushing aside these old-fashioned rules about when experiments are to be conducted in this study and what she's allowed to do as a part of this research team. And you, I, I, I do enjoy seeing her cast some of those aside, but I think it's important that we also have people like DePaul who are saying, well, you know, you are not technically a credential doctor. People love you. People 
like you, but, you know, I, I think it's important that the show's also letting us know that there are flaws in this plan as well. And I think it's setting things up for the future because Ginny in real life really did struggle with feelings of inadequacy as compared to Masters, even though famously she was the more... I don't know, beloved of the two. I don't know if beloved is the right word, but she was, obviously she was more in tune with other people. People liked her better, but all along she still really needed Bill's name to complete the circle. Right. She definitely needed his name and his credentials and his legitimacy. Definitely. For the project. Do you want to go on to talk about Margaret and Barton, or do you want to talk about Bill and Libby in Miami? Let's talk about Margaret and Barton. Okay, so um, we first really get a, a much better glimpse of Margaret in private. Before, we saw her at the anniversary party, and she's very bubbly, very charming, just a wonderful person, a wonderful partner for Barton to have as the provost. She's such a wonderful hostess, and here she is, private, in bed, reading Peyton Place after Barton has been to see Dale, and I saw a connection between her and Vivian, who ultimately gave her the book. And they're both still struggling to understand sexual pleasure as if they're both kind of on the same level as far as experience. Right. I didn't immediately pick up on that parallel as them being physically inexperienced, but I definitely liked that when Barton was brought into the scene, you know, he says, Mrs. Scully, you're reading a dirty book. And they have that playfulness in their marriage, but at the same time, there's so clearly something missing, particularly in the acting. You can see when Barton moves forward to kiss Margaret, you can see Alice and Janie do this weird sort of head tilt, you know, are you are you going to kiss me? Is this, what is what is about to happen? And then he kisses her on the nose. I just, it, that scene made me laugh, but at the same time, it was so, I think, telling about their marriage in that there's friendship, but there's also this unspoken lack that neither of them really can address for many reasons. Margaret, maybe because she doesn't have the language, she doesn't really have the experience to say this is what's missing. And Barton, obviously, because he has something to hide and something that doesn't fit within the context of a heterosexual marriage. And the fact that he ulti- that he winds up kissing her on the nose just comes off as so platonic and almost childlike. Yes. Alice and Janie is a, is a master of subtle acting gestures and she does them so well throughout this episode when when he first walks into the room and she makes that come here gesture to him it's so you just get a sense of like who like the kind of person that she is right off the bat that she's comfortable and casual and she's funny and charming and then like you said the little head bob thing that she does that was just I really liked that I think that's why I really liked them in this episode but generally during the season because, you know, Bo Bridges and Alice and Janie just play so well off of each other. They have all of these nonverbal things that come through in their performances that I just love. I want to mention Margaret and her Mahjong friends, her her rich girl club. Were we supposed to assume that the woman um, at playing Mahjong was the, the wife of the board member who's mentioned later in the episode? I think so. I think they had the same first name. The one thing of, that I, t- I mean, yeah, you take away that Margaret is really intrigued, but at the same time kind of nervous about what this means. That little moment where they all kind of look alike and they all kind of sound alike, but the first woman says, well, she hasn't had much time for dates in the evenings. And then the second one, the one who was in the study goes, okay. And it's this little bit of mean girls moment, like, bitch, why are you bringing this up in front of our friends? And then the first one who spoke says the word sex in this scandalized voice. It's just, (laughs) oh, God. That moment was just, that made me cringe more than anything. It was just so, so 1950s repressed and scandalized. But you could tell that all four of them were so intrigued and really taken with the whole idea. Like it was this perfect fantasy. (laughs) You meet Mr. Anonymous and you don't even know his name. Yeah, it was a great, it's a great little look into what Margaret does on a daily basis. And kind of um, the sort of activities that a well-heeled, wife of a faculty member at a university or any kind of powerful man, I guess, would be up to all day. So I think it's an interesting contrast between Margaret and Libby. Libby doesn't have a group of gals like that. She's just kind of, she's always on her own whenever we see her. I mean, I I do obviously feel sorry for Libby for many reasons in this episode, but 
particularly for Margaret, I feel sorry because even though she does have these friends and these, you know, women who she can talk to about personal subjects like a sex study, she's still very adrift and very unsure of herself. She says later in the episode when they're when she comes to visit Jenny, I think that self-confidence and the lack of it is maybe the only thing that she gave Vivian and I just thought that was so poignant and so sad. Especially since you see her as such a force in the previous episode. Yes, and generally, I mean, she's, you see Barton and you see Margaret and they're the the St. Louis power couple, as Mm. it were. Do you want to talk about Libby? And uh, since you mentioned her struggle with friends and let's, let's pick up that thread. So the scene where they're at home and he's sitting around in his underwear reading Freud. Unattractive, Bill. You're not allowed to give up after you get married. That's... Not cool. But Bill is, they're sitting around and Bill is still trying to convince Libby that they'll be fine on their own. But it's obviously still very much an open sore for her. And we really learn for the first time about Libby's tragic past. The fact that her mother died when she was young and her father disappeared, basically leaving her and her sister with the neighbors. And she and her sister were raised in a lot of comfort and they were sent off to finishing school and good schools and things like that. But ultimately, she still has always felt the lack of family is a huge hole in her side. And she's desperately searching for this. And I think with the the little bit of information that we get from that, it's interesting to me that she and Bill both have tragic early histories, but they're complete opposites. Bill had a family and he is trying to get away from them at all costs. He's trying to become a very self-made person. And right. Libby didn't have a family, and she is desperately trying to put one together and form one against his wishes. Well, and you know, to take it even further, Libby thinks their family is incomplete without children. She feels like a failure because she can't have children. The mere thought of children terrifies Bill into physically shaking, as we saw uh, early in last episode. I also found it very tragic that for Libby even when she goes to speak to uh, her neighbor about picking up their mail while they're on vacation, she, she can't even broach the subject about the lost baby or that she was ever pregnant at all. The woman keeps making comments on Libby's haircut, and it's just so awkward and cringeworthy. Really, the scenes with Libby were where I cringed the most this episode. <laughs> Nothing with Ginny or Lillian or Barton. It was all oh, God, no one's talking about anything. Talk about things. I think uh, Libby would benefit from some talk therapy even more so than than Austin probably would, as we see later in the episode. She's probably the one person. Not that, not that she needs a head shrinker. It's that she just needs some space to be able to talk about her feelings. To someone other than Bill, but also generally. Yeah, generally. I think she would benefit from just having this, having the time to say what she wants to say. Or at least be able to organize it in some sort of way. Because really, I think, you know, we only get feelings from Libby when she's pushed to the brink and just feels like she can't take any more because, you know, last episode she was in the process of miscarrying and she starts shouting at Bill you know, I need you to tell me the truth. I need this from you. And then here, when they're in Miami, she just tells him, you know, you're not here. And if you don't want to be here, then I don't want you here. It, it, it's just, I, I, I don't know. I just have a lot of pity. And I'm, I'm soft hearted for Libby because she just has to be pushed so far to be able to express even some of the smallest feelings. And when they get to the hotel, you watch Bill try to protect her by angrily calling downstairs to demand that the kids, you know, that something be done about the kids next door. And Libby is very placating. She doesn't want anything to be out of order. She just wants to relax and have a good time. And right before he turns to make the phone call, you really see on Bill's face, he he really does feel sorry for her. And he actually he genuinely is trying to protect her. Right. And and Libby tries to reconcile herself. Like he told her when they were packing, you know, why why isn't, you know, that's enough for me. Just the two of us. That's enough for me. And the implied thing that he doesn't say is why isn't that enough for you? And I think she's trying to kind of mold herself along the lines of what's good for Bill. And she says, you know, we can't spend the rest of our lives hiding from children. And he really takes her at her word. He doesn't see past the surface of what she says which is I think why he's suddenly so human in that moment and they embrace and it's really sweet 
And then later, the older couple is having sex for the third time while he's brushing his teeth. And all of a sudden, he just, it's like a switch just flips on and suddenly he's full medical study calculating and measuring in his head and they just completely go in opposite directions and she's trying to be charming and funny and seduce him a little and he is just I think because he's taken her at her word I think he thinks that they're not that they're totally past it but that it's not going to come up again in the immediate future and it's like her feelings are something that he deals with only when it's convenient to him And if it happens to coincide with something that interests him more, he'll gladly take one over the other. And the study is always going to come first. And I guess that was what you really have this hopeful feeling when the the Miami trip begins, not just, you know, for, for Libby, but just because you see a new side of their relationship, because you do see Bill trying to protect her in the best way that he knows how you know, calling downstairs and raising a stir about the kids next door. And then when they figure out it's this older couple, you know, they have for about a a day this little in-joke that they can really just play up whenever anything gets too awkward. And so I think that's why I kind of laughed at this scene because the first time we see Bill and Libby sharing a bed on screen, you know, they're, they're making jokes at this couple's expense and it's still funny, but at the same time, Bill's going off into scientific methods And here's Libby trying to seduce him and they're kissing and then Libby's eyes open and she goes, are you timing them? (laughs) It makes me laugh every time and I shouldn't laugh, but it's just, God, every time. What I liked is is she definitively turns the light off and it, it should be, if it had just cut off there, it would have been really sad and awful. But then he keeps talking. He goes, it's like something out of Ripley's. And it's as if he's talking to Jenny instead of Libby. He has no concept of his audience there. And it just makes it funny all over again in this awful way. He just does not understand why she does not want to talk to him right now. Is it the next Uh, morning that they walk out into the hallway and see the couple walking down the hallway too? I think it is. Because it's like all of a sudden it's funny again. and, And Bill is really really funny in that moment where he whispers that's pop goes the weasel to her so then we have bill and jenny on the phone with each other because bill can't handle not talking to jenny for more than 24 hours or less (laughs) and uh she this is a uh, an interesting scene because She's feeling comfortable enough to not only be in his office, but sitting in his chair, hanging out with his stuff, sort of getting to pretend for a little while. While Bill's away, she gets to pretend for a little while that uh, it's maybe it's her desk or something. Dr. Johnson is in. Dr. Johnson is in the house. In that scene, the, the thing that I took away the most was not only Bill and Jenny's continued comfort, talking about the work, talking to each other, you know, they've, they've become much more familiar, they're finishing each other's sentences, there's an ease in those interactions that there wasn't before. But not only that, you have that nice little moment where Jenny's looking through the, the, the textbook on the reproductive system, and Bill's kind of encouraging her, you know, you're on the right track, just keep going, keep asking questions. And she she comes up with, this is true, if, if the clitoris really does extend so far into the vaginal wall, then women don't need a man at all. Women don't need men. And and Bill has this stunned look on his face like, no, no, you've gone too far. Bring it back. Bring it back in. Yeah, it's the language that she uses. And that's kind of, that's kind of interesting or strange, I guess. She concludes that a male presence isn't required for women to go through their structured sexual response cycle. But the language she used makes it sound like she's telling Bill that men are totally obsolete, which I don't think that's the conclusion that she would draw. If she no. were, if she were pr- like pressed, but it is a terrifying thought to a white male who's used to being at the top of the pyramid. So even though they have this nice moment where they finish each other's sentences and she gets in a little jab at him about not turning his library books in on time, which was awesome, it still chips away. You know, it's like Bill suffers two big rejections all in, a, in the span of about 10 minutes in his mind their rejections. Because the first is, Jenny says, well, women don't need men physically. That's how he interprets that. And then Libby comes in and unknowingly doubles down on that idea because she flat out tells him, I don't need you here to have a good time. I don't need you here to process through my grief. In fact, just go home. If you can't be here with me mentally, just go home. And I think that's really what makes it such an insult 
to him. You know, because if, if it had just been, I think, Virginia talking about this theory and Libby hadn't come in five minutes later and said, okay, this isn't working, you need to go home, he probably would have just, you know, thought about it, maybe written it off, come up with something completely different, you know, to present to Virginia on the phone the next day. Instead, we have, in his mind, supposedly being confirmed because Libby comes in with her newfound sense of agency and just says, you know, you you can't put your feelings into words. You can't talk about this. I need to be able to unpack this and you need to go home. I hadn't thought of it that way, but I really like that. I really like that that's what prompts Bill to go along. You know, it's when he makes that phone call to her late at night, it's bitter, of course, because he ends it by saying, you know, well, we'll test your theory that women, that men are completely unnecessary. But I think it's right. almost contrite in a way, or maybe looking for, he, he's, he's told to go home by one wife, and then maybe he's kind of looking for, I don't know, he doesn't really seem to be looking for sympathy, but he kind of retreats back to his work wife. To where, you know, he knows that he at least won't be told that he is, not not that Libby told him that he was emotionally stunted, but essentially told, if you can't mentally be here, then just leave. Like, I'm not making any sense. Um, no, I, I understand. He's, he's looking for validation in some form. And if it's not going to come from Libby, his wife, then it's going to come from Jenny, who, you know, although she is his work wife, and they see each other mostly as professionals, he needs that that validation for reasons that maybe he can't or won't express to himself. While we're still talking about Libby, do we want to go ahead and talk about uh, the Weasels and Morris, or do we want to move in a different direction? Let's go ahead and finish out with Morris and his wife. Did you have anything that you wanted to say about Libby hanging out with him and getting her day drink on? (laughs) <laughs> Little Miss Compulsive Liar getting drunk. <laughs> there were so many awkward and funny elements of that story, but I guess the thing that I, I wondered initially if this was going to lead to Libby trying to find her own independence sexually, it, it's a kind of how Libby got her groove back. <laughs> but then when when she just freezes when Morris you know comes in and tries to seduce her, it was interesting to me because here we have Libby putting on this persona, you know, this very strong, widowed woman who is just trying to make the best of her life with her two adorable children and you know, living it up in Miami while she's got the time. And then all of a sudden, you know, that she she could have some part of that come true in the sense that, you know, she could have sex with this couple or with Morris and forget about Bill for a while. And all of a sudden, you know, we, we're hammered home with the point that Libby is nowhere near as adventurous as she'd like to pretend you know, she's not, not only is she, does she not have those qualities necessarily, she just, that's not her, her game. That's not what she's looking for. I want to talk a little bit about the parallels that I found between this episode and the uh, Aldous Huxley novel, Brave New World. Because I've yes. I found uh, a few. And for anyone who's listening who's never read the book, it's, uh, it was written at a time when, you know, it was kind of between the two world wars, and it's this dystopian novel that describes how the government has taken technology to a place where they use it to ensure that everyone in the population is happy all the time. There's no fighting. Everyone gets along. Um, Promiscuous sexuality is encouraged. Conspicuous consumptionism is encouraged. There are castes of people to ensure that all the work gets done. It's all very controlled. And the novel explores true happiness, mediocrity, and feeling as if there's something missing from the characters' lives because they are so... They're given everything they could ever want before they ever begin to feel wanting or lacking in something. Something rushes in to take its place. And so it kind of explores how immediate gratification and the long-term effects, I guess. Does that sound about right to you? Yeah, um, although I did look up the the publication date, and this actually came out in 1931, so we're not as removed from the uh, World Wars. Oh, I'm sorry, I meant be- between, between, like after World War One, but before World War Two. Okay, yeah. Yeah. Um, you're right in that there are a lot of parallels within this episode, but I think the one that I saw the most was... Um, in the in the novel, one of the the ways in which the population is kept happy is they get to go to the movies and uh, experience 
what they call the feelies, Mm -hmm. which is uh, essentially, I would say, soft porn films with a, you know, you know, the sensory modules and modifications so that you feel as if you were living the movie, which uh, especially once Margaret and Austin come out of Peyton Place and begin yeah. their their tryst, that's immediately what I thought of. And I think that's the strongest connection that I made from something that's in the book awesome. beyond what you just talked about. Yeah, that's that's totally one of the ones that I had in my list. So some of the other ones are the idea that society ought to be happy. And if you aren't happy, they have – in the book, they had medicine that they would take that would send them on these kind of pleasant hallucinogenic trips. But it was like they would call it going on a holiday. So Libby and Bill going to Miami is a way of getting away from their problems and getting to a place where no one will know who they are and no one will be able to judge them or make them feel awkward. There's also the, the fact that – Society as a whole in the 1950s was kind of this, you ought to be happy and you ought to conspicuously consume and that will make you happy. So I kind of saw a parallel there. There was also in the book, uh, the government conditioned babies against negative emotions or conflict. And I saw Libby's awkward talk with the neighbor lady and Bill constantly turning away from and deflecting Libby in the hotel when she was trying to express to him that she really needed to process her feelings there. Um, There's also no aging. Everyone in the population stays young and pneumatic, they say, uh, very fit and bouncy and uh, very sleek and attractive. The older couple still act like newlyweds, and they were very good-looking older people, so they're kind of still still behaving um, as if they were much younger and surprising Bill in that sense, because he kept going on about how their endocrine systems weren't producing any more hormones. Well, it doesn't really matter, you know. Um, then there's the, the central idea that everyone belongs to everyone else, which if two people wanted to have sex with each other, they should. And it doesn't matter how many sex partners you have. It doesn't matter, you know, you, you are supposed to be giving of yourself, which is, I think it benefits the men in the novel much more than it does the women. But, um, and there I saw the Mahjong ladies having anonymous sex. One of them joined the study and was learning a lot about her body from her anonymous partner, and also the older couple trying to rope Libby into a swinger situation. And then, like you said, Langham and Margaret just going for it whenever they felt like it. Like, the minute you felt a connection to someone, you were supposed to rush off and have sex with them in the novel. The book implies that even with all the conditioning and technological advances, the people who control the world can't totally wipe out the need for intimacy Um, sexual exclusivity and individuality out of people because even through all the processes that they go through there are still exceptions there are people who are exceptions so one of the major characters yeah outliers there's one of the major characters uh has to be like they have to send away people who express individuality but they still have to do it even though they think they've tamped it all down they, they still have to send people away i kind of i this this episode sort of makes the same conclusion So when it comes down to a stressful situation like Morris propositioning her, Libby realizes that she isn't equipped to handle things like that on her own when she thought it would be fun to pretend to be somebody else. And when reality crashes in on her, she can't really change who she is inside. And who she is 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 a pretty traditional housewife. And it's not that she's stupid. She's maybe a bit naive and trusting. You know, she's maybe a bit inexperienced with the stranger, stranger parts of the world. Not stranger, like bad but just strange nature yeah stranger danger stranger natures of the world um or i have here or maybe the episode is commenting on how women have a hard time fending off male advances unless there's another man involved to speak for them i don't know i think it could be doing both but part of what i saw with libby is that you know she she likes to see the best in everyone and so you know she doesn't although maybe she has a tiny bit of reservation uh, of Morris coming into her room late at night with a half full bottle of whiskey, you know, she really doesn't get that he's actually going to proposition her until, you know, they're there dancing and he's telling her about how his wife is home, but he can go anywhere he wants. And then she really does that danger sense does kick in for her. I like what you said about how in the novel it talks about uh, people wanting to express emotional intimacy and individuality in them either having to be medicated to take away those urges or to be shipped off. Because essentially, Ginny, not initially, I don't think this is what she's proposing, but she's so insistent on separating the act of sex from any sort of intimacy at all that given the way the episode ends, 
you wonder how she's justifying it to herself entering into this new phase of her relationship with Bill working or otherwise. I took her title drop line when she says to the nursing student, when we can do that, it's a brave new world. I thought that was kind of ominous. And I think yes. this this episode very carefully and very subtly explores or starts to explore getting past the idea of Ginny as a magical sex goddess who can do no wrong. Because I think she has this theme associated with her of, like you say, detaching love from sex. And when you do that, when you embrace all the data and the findings and you force it all into that, you're denying an essential part of humanity. And it's not that she's wrong to want to encourage women to take care of themselves sexually, because that prevents situations like Margaret not having an orgasm for what, like 40, 50 years? Right. But if you focus on on rem- like on just making it very scientific and very detached you're removing intimacy and you're removing a large part of the reason why people have sex in the first place and you I, I don't know I feel like discounting that she kind of I mean they, they kind of have to in order to make it be about the numbers and make it be a quantifiable study but she runs the risk of going back to that well too often and possibly doing herself a great disservice well and i think i'm trying to remember where i read this it may have been uh there's a blog called the provocracy where it talks about the geek social fallacies and one of them is that you can just have sex with anyone you want there's no feelings involved we are geeks and we can control our feelings apart from this physical thing that we're doing i think that's the trap that jenny runs the risk of falling into especially because like you said there's so much more to sex than the biological and physical mechanics you know it it does depend on who you're with and the feelings that you have about that before we get into the very ending i wanted to mention austin being in therapy and then um did you want to talk now about margaret coming in for the intake interview yeah let's talk about margaret okay so she comes in for the intake interview and reveals to Ginny and Bill that she's never had an orgasm and that sex is pretty much a tedious and sometimes painful, not chore, but just kind of an ordeal. A process. A process. There you go. And Ginny's shock at realizing that it's that Margaret's never had an orgasm, that it's even possible for a woman to have never had an orgasm, is yet another instance of Ginny being, like this episode kind of, showing us that Jenny is not the perfect person that she's built up to be by other people in previous episodes. Like, she's genuinely, genuinely stunned. And I think their their roles are kind of reversed in the interview because back when they were in the brothel, back when they were in the brothel, it was Jenny acting like, Bill, why are you acting like such an idiot? Like, and kind of being knowing and, you know, sort of anticipating what people were going to say and Bill being the one to make the not faux pas. Well, he was making faux pas, but just kind of stumbling his way through the interviews. And their roles are reversed here. Bill knows what Margaret is is suffering because he knows about Barton's sexual proclivities. And Ginny is totally in the dark and just forges on ahead, totally unknowing. And I think, too, we see Bill have a much better, quote, bedside manner here than we have with with almost anyone else, not just because he knows things about Barton and Barton's personal sexuality that he shouldn't, but also because, you know, he has been friends with Margaret and Barton for so long. You know, she's not just a woman coming in for this study. She's not... She's almost like his surrogate mother. Yes. Um, you know, he really takes pains to try to put her at ease. He apologizes for the, the nature of the questions. He's very self-conscious of her discomfort and like you said Jenny is is just sort of forging along I think Jenny is so keen on her her new role in this experiment and in forging these new hypotheses that she not forgets that there are people involved but she almost takes it for granted that the human sexual experience is something everyone has and everyone has experienced yeah plus she's just Jenny has clearly lived a life spoilt for choice in terms of having orgasms. Like she's just, she's, she's maybe had to work for a few, but she's never really suffered in confusion. No, she hasn't had confusion. She hasn't been shy about expressing herself. I kind of wonder how that's going to play out in season two, being able to sympathize with their patients, you know, and trying to help people. 
um, get to a point where they can fix their sexual dysfunction. Like if you've never if you've never experienced something, it's hard to sympathize with other people. And I think that's where Ginny comes across not necessarily as callous here, but as very green far removed. Yeah, very yes. very green. Yes. Because Bill, you know, here's where his years as the seasoned researcher and doctor have have really put him at an advantage here. He can listen to Margaret's stories about how she's not sure if she's had an orgasm. These are the sensations that she's feeling, but you know, there is a sense of relief at the end. Tremendous relief. Just watching his face and the hesitancy on Margaret's as they're in this interview was really, I think, the best part of this scene for me because, you know, while Jenny is still trying to process, you know, can can such a relationship even exist, one where you are married and you've never had an orgasm and you have sex once a year or less, while Bill, he's trying to, to make the interview as comfortable as he can for Margaret and it's just... I think, trying to salvage as much of her dignity as is humanly possible at this point. And this scene made the, I think it was Rolling Stone's list of the top 100 TV scenes of 2013. This, I think this one was like number five. I'm not surprised. It was a good one. I, I was, I, I'm glad that they chose it. I'm, I'm a little surprised that they chose this one over the wealth of other ones that they had throughout the first season. Well, I think this one we were talking about last week how Vivian really represents the type of woman who the study could have benefited if it was already out. But in a way, so does Margaret, because here's someone who, although she doesn't know it at this time, is in a marriage essentially of convenience and of platonic love, but certainly not romantic love. And this is really where the parallel between Margaret and Vivian as far as their sexual inexperience and their, their lack of experience with sexual pleasure and their confusion really comes to a head. I, I thought as well, you know, coming off this scene and the the raw poignancy of it, when contrasted with the, the awkward conversation at the Scully's dinner table and Vivian trying to, I think, almost project her own romantic experiences onto her parents. And, and the entire scene where Margaret and Barton are just having two totally separate conversations and neither one of them is really contributing to the others. Margaret's just off... I don't know if, if I could really read any deeper to her, her monologue about the wallpaper in the kitchen. Maybe you could say, maybe you could read it as a meta-contextual look at Barton. Maybe she's starting to realize that Barton is kind of, by not providing her with sexual pleasure, by not making that a part of their relationship, he's maybe she's starting to formulate this idea that, well, those are the best years of my life, and look what happened, and... I think you're on the right track. You know, maybe it's not to that point yet. I've wasted the best years of my life, but she certainly is sort of thinking about it and coming off of this enormous rejection and saying, well, you know, maybe maybe my husband isn't as wonderful and amazing as I used to believe because for all the, the good things that we have in our relationship and the family that we have, there's still something missing there. And now someone has pointed that out to me and I feel bad because of it you know I feel the lack where maybe she wasn't able to put it into words before let's talk about oh let's talk about Austin in therapy <laughs> with Cameron Fry with Cameron Fry who who of course would become a psychoanalyst and then travel back in time you know of course that's what he would do I was happy I, to, I was happy to see him I was really happy to see him because I love that this show just gets I know we've talked about this before but I just love that this show gets these actors from series and movies in the 80s and 90s and brings them in for guest spots just little one-offs where you're like hey I know that person and then they say something funny and you move on I like that <laughs> um it was funny to me that the point of this episode was for Ginny and Jane to run this experiment that essentially cut the Freud's theory down and here Austin goes back and goes into psychoanalysis and is encouraged by his therapist to explore his feelings toward his mother. That struck me as uh, Bill and Ginny have a long way to go in deconstructing Freud. But it's a good first step. Well, and I thought it was funny, too, because, you know, obviously they're they're well on their way to proving Freud wrong on a scientific sense, but maybe in a social or literary or cultural sense, like you said, they've still got a long way to go because these theories didn't necessarily pop into the air for no reason. There had to be some sort of observing going on, one would hope. 
Yeah, and I think with Margaret being older than Austin and what plays out after this episode in their relationship, what we see later with the way they treat each other, I think the show kind of doubles back and uh, and almost proves Dr. Cameron Fry right. Yeah, it was kind of a sly wink to that, you know. We did talk about the Oedipus complex, and here we have an Oedipal man and his mother figure. Yeah. Um, I, I, I really did, though. I, I enjoyed their interactions just because you really get such a different sense of their characters when Austin and Margaret are interacting. It's not just, okay, here's this horn dog who... His wife's at home and he's just chasing women around the hospital hoping to solve his impotence. And here's Margaret adrift in her own very well-to-do life. You know, you really get the sense that he sees Margaret as someone who has life wisdom to offer and who can comfort him and make him feel better. Not sexually, of course, even though that ends up happening. But mm-hmm. it, I just, I, I like the role reversal there. I like the fact that Austin is shown as this younger boy who really doesn't quite know what to do with himself at this point now that he has found impotence and here's Margaret just trying to give him some good natured advice. All right. Is it time to talk about some boob touching? I think it's time to talk about boob touching. Yeah. <laughs> so I don't know that we really have a clear idea. I think there are several facets to what motivates each of them to do what they do in the last few minutes of this episode. It's not clear cut. No, there's so many little moments that lead up to that, to Jenny just stripping off her shirt. Well, and not only that, but Bill promoting her in the first place. When this episode first aired, I think a lot of commenters felt that it was a closed feedback loop, that Bill stepped in and and did something good for Jenny, and she took her shirt off in a way to reward him. I'm not sure that I see it that way, but it could be it could be one of many reasons or motivations for her to do that. I think that's part of it, but I don't think they would see it as such. If does that make sense? Right, I don't think she would it would be willing to admit that on any level, and I don't think it would be anywhere close to the top of the list of reasons she did it. But I think unconsciously that's part of what motivates her, you know, because at least in my notes it's you, you go from the two of them running the experiment to Bill overhearing Jenny's conversation with the nurse, their subject, and then all of a sudden, you know, Bill promotes her. They go through that little detente of, are you firing me again? And then it's that same snappy give and take that we see them have with the science, you know. Well, what about this? What about this angle? We should keep asking questions. We should keep doing this. And then all of a sudden, you have Bill sly... I won't say attempted seduction, but it's definitely, he's putting out feelers to see how far this could go. You think so? In what way? I don't know. It was something, maybe I just, maybe it's a case of seeing what you want to see in the performance, but Bill's little, you say that women can have breast orgasms. I'd need to see proof of that. That It's that same dry humor that he always uses, but there's... Just enough awkwardness and self-consciousness about the way he does the line reading that, yeah, I agree, there's something to it. There was like a little spotlight shined on that. Yeah, it just, something kind of made me sit up and pause when I, when I heard that the first time, but even in the rewatch, it really stood out for me. Do you think that Bill was motivated to promote Ginny, in, at least in part or in whole, because of his conversation with Dr. DePaul? I think yes and no, honestly, because I obviously she she was promoted due to her work on the study you know she she was good at her job and she was able to do something that bill was not but at the same time in the show especially when it showed lillian speaking to bill they're cut from the same cloth and so she she gets in that little dig about you know i i admired you for your intellect but you know with with mrs johnson i'm not sure which part of you is now making the judgments i think he does have that desire to prove her wrong and to to make sure that if not everyone knows that Lillian knows that sex is not the only reason Virginia is here. I kind of, I got the feeling in a way that promoting Virginia from secretary to research assistant legitimizes her and legitimizes, like it, it, it would draw away speculation of, because in a hospital in the 1950s, it's going to be expected that the doctors are having affairs with their secretaries or their nurses or these specific little boxes that women were placed into. And by pulling right. Ginny out of one of those boxes and putting her in a different box, maybe it would deflect 
that traditional suspicion. I think it might have also been him trying to prove a point on his own as well. Just, you know, he's not the, I don't know, it it just felt like he, not that he didn't want to carry the whole weight alone because he loves his ego and he loves the study and that is the be all and end all of this research. But I think he does sense now in a way that he didn't earlier that there is a danger, like you said, of people drawing their own conclusions and leaving out these important contributions because of Virginia's personal status. And I also wondered if maybe part of his motivation would have been panicking, not direct like at the forefront of his <laughs> mind, but panicking in the back of his mind over the idea of being, like he said earlier in the episode, completely unnecessary. Like he has he has a few trump cards in his pocket, being the white man at the top of the pyramid. And this right. is one of them, you know, having the ability to reach down and pluck her out of obscurity and set her up and be the Pygmalion is one of his power cards. And it's also conveniently a way to get, you know, to stroke Ginny's ego. She's ambitious. She's, of course, she's going to look at an, a promotion and, and just see stars and hearts. Well, and it kind of reminds me of uh, the early season of Mad Men. One never knows how loyalty is born. True. You know, I I don't think he intended to bind Ginny to him with this promotion, or maybe he did. Maybe that was a conscious thought, but it's it's certainly something that would cement her place in his life and his place in hers. Well, at least at least for this episode, next episode yeah. that that turns into something funny. Um, and then we have Ginny's motivations to just go over and take her shirt off and start attaching those electrodes. <laughs> that. I loved rewatching this episode for this scene because here you have Jenny just sort of business like, well, you know, here are my boobs. I'm just going to start taping electrodes to me. And Bill watching her without actually turning around to watch her, I kept cracking up. There was a moment when she was standing behind him before she started undoing her shirt where she just suddenly had this funny little cork to her mouth. Like she was thinking, oh, I'll give you something to really think about. Like, here we go. You better get yourself ready because it's on now. <laughs> We're doing this. Earlier in the episode when he's getting ready to go on vacation, there's that they have a discussion about women in his office claiming that they're frigid and how maybe their husbands are, just aren't satisfying them enough. And she is just, I, I can't quite tell if she's openly flirting with him or if she's kind of doing this self-satisfied little, I, I've seen you at your worst, we have a deeper connection now kind of routine. I think maybe it's an early sign of her, when I say affection, I don't mean romantic specifically, even though that could play into it, but it's sort of a personal connection. It's that banter. It's the, the, yeah, it's the banter. And I think, I think we're getting an early idea of the fact that Ginny likes Bill in spite of all the shit he brings down on her. She really does like him. I agree. You definitely... In that scene, you see it, and even when Bill is trying to go about promoting her, and he says, I don't want you to be my secretary anymore, and instead of, you know, in the first episode or two where she would just yell at him or, you know, leave to gather herself together, she just says, you're firing me? Again? There's that fondness underneath the frustration that we really haven't gotten uh, until now. Yeah, and I kind of wonder if, this emotional manip- manipulation back and forth to be not really tricked, I guess, maybe he is tricking her, but to be sort of walked into this idea of, well, you're fired and I'm not directly telling you that, but I'm going to let you think that for a couple of seconds and then I'm going to rescue you from that and make you feel great because I'm going to tell you how that you're, that you're a great research assistant and now I'm going to promote you. I think to go through that gamut of emotions in about 30 seconds would be an adrenaline rush. And I think, I think it would, it would uh, make her feel justified or at least comfortable in taking a huge risk and just start undoing her shirt. Like, I really think that's, that's part of, that's a huge part of her motivation. It's just that she's, she's on top of the world all of a sudden. And she, this seems like a great idea to do this right now. Yeah, she's coming off that rush of adrenaline, like you said. I yeah. could definitely see that happening. Yeah. So she just reaches for his hand and slaps it right up on her tip. <laughs> and I think, I will say this again, I said this before, but I think we can assume from what happens in episode four with George staying over when he's giving her oral sex, he's got his hand up massaging her breast. And I think we can assume between this episode and the next that Jenny likes it. Jenny like. Hmm. 
I don't really have anything else to say about the boob touching other than always awesome, but <laughs> the oh well, this didn't really fit into uh, any of our earlier conversations, but when when Morris is trying to seduce Libby in the hotel room, my funny Valentine is playing on the stereo. <laughs> I think I laughed for about five straight minutes the first time I watched this episode. One thing that I noticed, and this will tell you both what a pedantic watcher I am, as well as how many times I've watched this part of the episode, but when Ginny is sticking the electrodes onto her bare chest, in one shot the tape goes horizontally, and in the next shot it it's got it going vertically. They need a continuity, <laughs> continuity. editor. They desperately need a continuity editor. It could be you, Melissa. It you could be me. They could hire me to watch for things like this. I'd be okay with that. That'd be a pretty sweet job. That would be a pretty sweet job. Well, all right. I This has been Masters of Podcasting, and we will see everybody next week. It's going to be some uh, it's gonna be some interesting times next week. <laughs> a brave new world, shall we say. Uh, and all these people in this brave new world. All right. See you guys next time. Bye.